Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to our uh, third informal workshop on the RDRS rulemaking. It's around 10 o'clock right now, but we will wait a few minutes until 10.05 until we formally start just to give any uh, stragglers a few extra minutes to show up. So with that, thank you, and we'll check in again in just a couple minutes. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so it is 10.05 and we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Dan Brown. I'm the manager of the knowledge integration section in the policy office at CalRecycle and I'm excited to have this third uh, workshop. Uh, the team worked very hard to get the draft um, proposed regulatory changes out uh, last week um, so people could review and have an opportunity to um, determine what kind of questions or comments they may have on these proposed reg language. Um, so Eric, um, who's going to take over here in a moment, is going to show everyone where those can be found if they have not already had a chance to do so. We're going to go through and provide a very brief discussion of the changes by section, uh, and we'll be soliciting questions as we go along. Uh, and then if, you know, we're not going to have time to get to everything, unfortunately, 
Um, but uh, if anyone has any comments or questions on portions of the regulations that we're unable to get to today, um, please send those comments and questions to the rulemaking email, which again, we should be able to share as part of this um, webinar. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Eric. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, yes, everyone, sorry, I should say my name is Eric. I'm organizing the rulemaking along with Priya. And so let me share my screen to show you where you can find the regulations if you haven't already seen them. So you should be able to see the Cal Recycle uh, webpage in front of you. And if you have not already found and downloaded the regulations, one thing that you can do is go to our search bar and type in something like RDRS updates. And when you search for that, the first link here will take you to the updates to our regulations reporting, uh, our regulations page. Scrolling down, we have an informal rulemaking documents <coughs> section, which has our regulatory draft text. So I'm just gonna download that, which downloads a PDF, and here's the document. So like Dan said, we will uh, go over each section, just kind of give a brief overview, and then we can you know, take questions as we go along. To ask a question, you can either raise your hand, and then if you, you know, that's if you want to chat, make your comment or question verbally, you can raise your hand and then we'll be able to see that on our end and we can allow you to unmute yourself. Um, once we do that, you'll still have to, click on your end to unmute yourself. This is just, we can get, give you that ability to unmute yourself. So you won't be able to stop talking until you take that second step. Alternatively, you can post your questions in the questions box and we'll uh, just keep an eye on that as we go along. So with that in mind, uh, let me just kind of zoom in a little bit here. Make this a little bit bigger. Oh. And I'll just kind of go through them. So hey, one already, one have, sorry, we already have one question. The question. Ah, uh, yes. Part. Thank you, Priya. So there's a question: um, Are the revisions highlighted and, str and struck out? Yeah, that's a great question. I can just show you that here on the draft. You should be able to see on 18815.1 um, subsection subdivision C, for example, there's an underlined change here. So underline means a new insertion and strikeout means a deletion. So kind of standard um, regulatory language syntax. Let me drop the link. Sure. Let's see. We had another question. Can we just drop the link in the chat? I can do that. So there's the link to the regulations um, in the chat if you want to download it right now rather than <clears throat> going through the process of typing in. Okay. So in 18815.1, we're not doing any, any real changes to the regulations that affect uh, reporting. The change that you can see here in front of you is due to a change to the Administrative Procedures Act, which is just it's just updating the references. So I won't kind of go through that. It doesn't doesn't affect any any reporting entity in RDRS. For our definitions section 18815.2, as we've discussed in the prior uh, rulemakings uh, workshops, there are kind of two major changes in the definitions more than what you can see. Of course, there are more than two changes that you can see on the screen, but the two major changes really are that we added a new definition for collection method, which I'll scroll to in just a minute. And we added a, we kind of changed the definition of, of source sector. So kind of scrolling through this, um, 
You can see we have some changes for alternative daily cover and alternative intermediate color cover. <clears throat> These changes are not, uh, I'm just gonna turn off my screen so I'm not distracting everyone with just kind of my visual here. The changes for alternative daily cover and intermediate cover are not, not substantive. We're really just kind of changing the wording so it's kind of more systematic and follows standard uh, procedure. Likewise, that's what you can see in beneficial reuse. We've changed this word article to article rather than section. So I'm just going to scroll to collection method here. So collection method, we have to define collection method because SB 343, of course, requires us to collect information about collection methods. So we need to define what that is. And in our first workshop, we talked about how collection method would include you know, various things. And what we're basically saying in the regulations now is that collection method includes at a minimum, the source sector, material stream, and where the material was required to be collected or segregated for collection or receipt. Uh, it's easiest to see this in an example. So for a collection method, we're thinking things like contract haul commercial mixed waste. So you receive it from a contract hauler, it's the source sector is commercial, and the material stream is mixed waste. Conversely, the material stream could be something like uh, mixed recycling or source sector or recycling. So we're not asking for, you know, very granular things, you know, the what house it's coming from, if it's residential, it's really just residential versus commercial, kind of mixed recycling, mixed waste, that kind of thing. We do know, however, that some entities in RDRS, not, not every entity is going to receive material from direct haul, meaning from, or from a contract hauler. So if you're a transfer processor, for example, and you receive material from a recycler composter for like its residual solid waste, you're not going to have to figure out what the source sector is for that residual material. It's just going to be, you received it from a transfer processor. So whenever material is received, not from a contract hauler, you're just going to report the reporting entity, entity that you received it from basically okay. under the current regulations. We have a question from Veronica Pardo about when the RDRS reporting requirements are expected to begin. Yeah, that's a great question. So <clears throat> you, can't, you don't see it here in the definition section, but in our methods and elsewhere in the regulations, we've specified that most of the changes won't take effect until 2024 Q4. And we're doing that to ensure that we have enough time, one, to build the changes into RDRS and two, to reach out to you and other stakeholders to explain what the new changes are going to be. For the changes that take effect earlier than 2024 Q4, um, they don't re really require any changes to RDRS and they're not, they're not really requiring new reporting behavior on the stakeholder part. They're really just clarifying things. Um, and don't really have a regulatory effect. Any Anything that's going to be a new a reporting burden or new reporting style or just a new reporting thing, that won't take effect until 2024 Q4, at least how the way that we've currently written the regulations. We have another question. Is there a de revised defined list of types of material streams you want to identify? From Rick Mark. So that's a great question. Let's come back to that when we get to section 1A 15.9, which where we talk about methods. Um, if we forget to answer your question during the methods section, please just, just ask it again and we'll come back to that. And we have one more question from Kat Garcia. Does the definition need to capture POTWs, I'm not sure what that is, and their unique collection methods. Can you clarify what you mean by uh, POTW? Yeah. 
wastewater treatment plants. Ah, right. So one of the things that we are going to do as we implement these regulations is you'll notice that collection method does not specify all of the different types of possible collection method that occur just because you know we can't envision all of the types that could ever occur so we're trying to leave the regulations general and then once we start getting into the implementation phase we'll be reaching out to stakeholders and like yourself to figure out what you know really the exact collection method options should be um, for wastewater treatment even though it's not in the examples here we were envisioning we would have a wastewater treatment example um, but it might not necessarily require to the source sector component might be like residential slash commercial you know because it might not really be possible for wastewater treatment facilities to discriminate between residential versus commercial wastewater that's coming in um, though if all of those facilities tell us it is possible then yeah we might want them to say like this is residential wastewater or this is commercial wastewater coming in. Okay, so to keep going through the methods, uh, since we do only have two hours, just to kind of highlight some of the uh, big ones here. We have a new definition for export because AB881 requires us to collect jurisdiction of origin information for exported materials. The main highlight for the export definition is that the export is really talking about where the material is taking control of. So if you send material to, for example, a broker transporter, who, but that broker transporter operates in California, that's not going to be considered export from the purposes of RDRS. Uh, the material is only exported once it's finally sent out of country. So the broker transporter, if they're the one who arranges for that material to be exported out of country, then they would be the one who is considered to have exported material not you as the person who has sent it to the broker transporter. So keep going. Let's talk about mixed plastic waste. Again, this is also for AB881. The main highlight here is that AB881 defines mixed plastic waste as anything that is not plastics one, two, and five solely. So we're basically just replicating that definition. Uh, so anything that's a mixture of plastics that's not only one, two, and five is going to be quote unquote mixed plastic waste. We're also sorry. adding a definition. Sorry to interrupt. There's one question from Larry Switzer on why 10.5 collection method many loads are mixed. Can you repeat that question? question on why 10.5 collection method many loads are mixed 10.5 now I, I don't really understand what that question means mixed loads i'm sorry larry can you rephrase that Larry, you, you're also, um, you can, uh, you're unmuted. You can chat if you, you can hear want me. to see your question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I'm trying to get through. So the collection method, sometimes your examples, contract all commercials, mixed ways, contract all residential. Sometimes they're mixed all in the same truck. So are we going to be able to use the methods later to aggregate that by a percentage rather than per vehicles or other reports? 
Yeah, so if you're receiving contract hauled residential and contract hauled solid waste all in the mixed truck, all in the same truck, um, I would hope that the contract hauler knows information about like what percentage of materials are from like residential versus versus commercial because otherwise I don't know how you would be reporting accurately in RDRS as it is currently. Well, it's um, estimated and they usually aggregate over multiple vehicles. Right. Give us a percentage number. So that'll still be allowed through this with the use of, the use of this term. Yes. Um, but the way we've currently written the regulations is by tons. So you would have to multiply those percentages out by the um, tonnage inflow that that you got from the contract hauler. We have a calculator. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. We have a question from Edward Boyson. My apologies if I'm not pronouncing your last name correctly. I don't think these draft regulations include newly defined material types and forms. Will that also be defined later during implementation? Yeah, so again, we can come back to that in the methods section, but um, that's it. I'll just cover that briefly now. So the new updated regulations don't really provide a definition for material type uh, versus form because our definition of material is really an amalgamation of both type and form. So what we are going to do is to update our material types list. Um, so in RDRS, when you have to report a material type, you know, you can search and select any of different material types in the list. So we are going to update that list of options that people can use to more, um, to better discriminate between type and form. Since our list right now is sort of a mixture of both type and form. So we're just tr going to try to update that list to make it more internally consistent and better able to discriminate between type and form. Eric, could you answer when will that list be developed? So I can't say when specifically we're going to develop that list, you know, because we have to get through the regulatory stage, the regulations first. And then once we start developing that list, you know, we'll follow the same procedure that we followed uh, when we first started RDRS development, you know, which I'm sure included reaching out to like publishing initial drafts of the list to get feedback from stakeholders on like, is this a reasonable material type, for example. We also have a follow-up question from Larry on 25.5. How do we report wastes from tribal lands? In terms of collection method? I'm not sure. The question just says that. How do we report waste from tribal lands? Yeah, Go can ahead, you clarify Larry. your question, Larry? Yeah. It's not a collection method question. The new definition for export indicates that for purposes of this article, tribal lands within the United States or tribal holdings of the United States shall not be considered outside the United States. Yes. How does that fit into the system when facilities are getting loads from tribes and not for sending to tribes? Well, so that's, I think you're talking about two separate things. One is that if you are reporting disposal of tribal land that is reported you know, as normally, so you would report the inflow from your tribal land and, and you would report the jurisdiction as, as a tribal land. But if you're exporting, quote unquote, exporting, you know, sending material to a tribal land for the purposes of this um, article, we're just saying tribal lands don't don't count as as export basically and so if you were if you were sending you know end use to a tribal land you would you would just report end use as as normal um, none of our material streams really rely on 
kind of this export definition except for mixed plastic waste. Okay. All right, so that's export. Um, you might notice there's a change to a government entity here. While there's a lot struck out, it's really just a non-substantive change, really just kind of um, rewriting several things in the regulations to be uh, more uh, consistent based on kind of what our legal office is telling us. So let's scroll through. We talked about mixed plastic waste. I mentioned the mixed plastic, or the mixed waste organic collection stream. Yeah, I'm wondering, Priya, if you can mute yourself. Um, the mixed waste organic collection stream, we've added that because uh, the 1383 regulations reference that. Uh, so we're not really changing the regulations right now for the organic collection stream. We're just adding it so there's a definition there. So that's not really a big change. And let's keep going. So one of the things that we've done is to add We've defined solid waste information system or SWIS, and that's because later on in the regulations I'll mention, we are now going to be asking entities to provide their SWIS number if they have one. Right now, currently that's optional, um, but the new regulations will require that only if you have a SWIS number though. If you, if you operate a facility that's not registered in SWIS and is not required to be registered in SWIS, then you know, this, obviously you have nothing to report, so that doesn't apply to you. The other main change that I mentioned a few minutes ago regarding source sector, that's kind of the other big definition change, um, is that source sector, we're now going to be asking you to split self haul um, into commercial versus residential components, which I'll get to in the method section about how we're going to do that. And any entity that you receive material from that's not a contract hauler or a transfer processor, it's just going to be designated as such. Um, currently, our regulations specify that if, for example, a landfill receives material from a recycler, like residual solid waste, the landfill would consider that self-haul. But that's not really what that material is. That material has an unknown source sector. Uh, so that's really what this addition, we're adding a new category which is effectively going to be an, un, an unknown source sector, but um, you know we're just going to use a long name. We're going to call it reporting entity other than contract hauler or transfer processor. So we're trying to get more granular information about source sector and to kind of clarify when things are actually unknown, since right now it kind of gets mixed in. So that's 18.15.2. Uh, 18.15.3. Let's see. The main changes, I would say, are, let me go to my section, my notes here. So in 18815.3, we are clarifying several things about registration and reporting. Um, there aren't really too many substantive changes to 18815.3. People are really mostly behaving in the ways that the regulations were, were meant to say, but we kind of realized that the regulations could be rewritten to kind of clarify that. So that's what we've done in 1815.3 is really added a number of clarifying uh, language components, not, not really changing things too much, but I'll go through and I'll point out uh, the changes. The first thing, and I'm just gonna skip over the changes that are non-substantive, like for example, we've struck out the word subdivision here and just changed it to division. So I'm just not gonna go over that kind of stuff anymore. So we have a section in 18815.3 that lists the entities who are not required to report, who are exempt from RDRS reporting. Uh, we have added a line that explains that brokers and transporters who take control of material outside of California are exempt, and that's because they're out of California facilities, right? We can't regulate um, entities that exist and operate outside of California. And, you know, they were never really required to report anyways. This is not really a big change. Right? 
wanted to have that in there. And then we've made a number of changes to 18815.3D, which explains how sites with multiple activities uh, need to register and report in RDRS. The main change is to paragraph four here, where the goal is to explain that facilities basically need to look at the sum total of all of their activities on their facility when they determine reporting. And so there are two components to this. One is that if a facility operates like a single reporting entity activity, you're not really supposed to be splitting that reporting entity activity arbitrarily into different reporting entities in RDRS to say that each one is below the reporting thresholds. You need to look at that reporting entity as a whole to evaluate reporting thresholds. Uh, likewise, if your site itself has multiple reporting entities all with the same operator, if any one entity is above reporting thresholds and you actually should be reporting for all entities on site because we really need to have a, like a whole picture of the activities on the site. You know, it could be misleading for reporting if you're doing a lot of other things and we only have the one entity reporting. Paragraph seven is really targeted towards recycler composters. This is just saying that if a recycler composter chooses not to report together with their parent transfer processor or disposal facility, they still need to report separately. Uh, just kind of clarifying a potential, um, not loophole, but you know something that people might misinterpret in paragraph in D originally. And paragraph F here, it looks like we've made a lot of changes. You know, there's a lot of new text, but um, the basic gist of paragraph F is that um, entities really just need to start reporting as soon as they are subject to reporting requirements. So currently in our regulations, without all these changes, when an entity becomes subject to reporting in RDRS, they are allowed to start reporting the quarter after. And you know, we've decided there they should really begin reporting in that quarter in which they become subject. But as I noted earlier, we do have whenever there's a new reporting requirement, we're we're not starting this until October 1st, 2024, um, because you know it's not really reasonable to kind of backdate this regulatory change to pre-existing um, entities. So continuing on, uh, we have G and H in 18815.3. These respectively are dealing with changes to an activity's um, status. So entities can request to become inactive, closed, or exempt in RDRS. And G and H are really just clarifying that process. Um, so it looks like we've added a lot of new language, but generally we're just clarifying that when you request to become inactive or exempt or closed, you have to justify that to the department. Um, and the existing regulations weren't clear in all scenarios where you had to justify. So we said, basically, whenever you make any change, any request, you have to justify that. And kind of the most important change here is that we're not going to backdate requests. So if you um, become exempt today, you really can't tell us two years from now and expect us to exempt you for those two years where you didn't tell us because you're supposed to tell us basically immediately or within 30 days whenever you have such a change. Um, so if you become exempt or inactive or your whole site closes, you should tell us as soon as you can because we're not, we're not going to backdate uh, those requests. Let's continue on to um, N. So the main change in N here, N is originally dealing with um, how entities are responsible for the information in their, in their reports. We're mainly just clarifying that if the department or an entity identifies an error, 
uh, you need to do something about that within 10 days. Uh, previously, it was a little unclear. The wording was unclear because we said you have 10 days plus an additional 14. And it wasn't clear whether it was 10 or 24. So we're just clarifying you know, 10, 10 business days specifically, unless the department has granted you additional time. It looks like there's a question. Uh, what time will we be talking about SP 343? Um, we'll kind of get to that as, as we go along in the regulations. It's like there's another question within 10 days of discovery. So paragraph two is really talking about when the department notifies you. So if we have notified you, you have 10 days to do something about it within that notification. On the other hand, there are other regulations continuing on just in P, P basically, if you discover it on your own, you should do something within 10 days. Item two. Yeah, so item two is about if the department notifies uh, or if the reporting entity identif identifies an error. It's, it's either. I see your comment, Carlos. Thank you for that. We can look at that in the regulations. So we're about halfway through our first hour. So I'm sorry, I think I need to speed up a little bit to get through uh, more of the kind of bigger stuff. So in Q here, um, Q is not really, Q is an entirely new subsection, but it's not really requiring anything new except for one thing, which I'll note. So Q is just clearly, more clearly specifying the process for registration. For example, uh, some sites have registered multiple uh, facilities that are at different addresses within different within the same site. And the way RDRS works is we can really only have one physical address per site. So that's what these regulations are mostly clarifying. If you have multiple facilities that are at different sites, different physical addresses, those should be different sites within RDRS. And the new registration requirement is just SWIT requiring Swiss number, which I mentioned earlier. And we're requiring Swiss number mainly because we often get public Re records act requests and internal requests from others for data organized by Swiss number. Uh, so it'll be much, the data that RDRS contains will be much more useful for stakeholders and internal staff if we can really have as many Swiss numbers as possible associated with the RDRS IDs. Okay. Uh, so reporting requirements for haulers, there was a question earlier about when are we gonna talk about SB 343? Well, SB 343 will apply to kind of each of the reporting entity sections. So I'll talk about that uh, as we go. This first little bit here is really just about self haulers. And the goal there is to just say that if a self hauler is delivering to a reporting entity, that reporting entity has the authority to request information from the self hauler, like the self hauler has to give you stuff about collection method. You know, where where is it from, which includes the source sector, residential, commercial, that kind of thing. There's not really a change there. It's just increasing the amount of information that self haulers are providing to reporting entities. Uh, contract haulers, uh, they are still they have the same general reporting requirements as they currently do, which is that for contract haulers that send material to um, in-state reporting entities. They don't report in RDRS. Instead, they just report to the reporting, they give information to the reporting entity. And if a contract hauler is hauling tons to land application in-state or to tons out of state, then they have to report in RDRS. For the tons that contract haulers, for the information that contract haulers give to reporting entities, we are updating the information that they have to provide so that those reporting entities can provide information re required by SB 343 um, and AB 81. In particular, contract haulers originally were only required to provide jurisdiction of origin for solid waste. And we're expanding that to basically include any material. So solid waste, green material for beneficial reuse, mixed plastic, 
haulers need to give the origins for that material to the destination reporting facility. Um, they also need to provide source sector, of course, for solid waste. That's not a change. And they need to provide the collection method through which the material was received. So when uh, Larry Sweetser's facility gets uh, material from a contract hauler, the contract hauler will need to provide the collection method. We had a question from Veronica Pardo. Are jurisdictions expected to reflect self-hauler expectations in a local ordinance? I would say uh, no, but Dan, if you have any other thoughts on that, uh, please chime in. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a short answer, but that's correct. Um, nothing in this would require a local jurisdiction to establish ordinances for self-haulers. Um, basically, any there's already requirements for how um, facilities should collect information from the self-haul sector, and so that remains how that information may be collected. Excellent, thank you, Dan. So continuing on with self-haulers, uh, or contract haulers, excuse me, the other main change for contract haulers, well, there are two other, excuse me, two other main changes. In their, in their reports that contract haulers submit to the department, not to the information that they give to reporting entities. So these are tons sent out of state. Contract haulers will need to provide the collection method. So uh, like any other reporting entity, they will be required to provide collection method, but you know only when they send out of state. And contract haulers will also have to provide the jurisdiction of origin for mixed plastic waste tons that they export out of state. Um, so this probably won't happen too often. So it's not relevant for most of the people on the call, but contract haulers who export mixed plastic waste will have to do, report that in RDRS. You notice there's a big struck out section for reporting. When reporting is due, we've just moved that elsewhere in the regulations for organizational purposes. So that's not a big change. All right, let's talk about uh, transfer processors. The first main change that you can see here, we've added a new like paragraph chunk of text to uh, the transfer processor inflow section. And without kind of reading out what that text is, the basic goal of this point here is to accommodate situations in which transfer processors have to send material to specific destinations. So you might have the situation where a transfer processor like X is sending tons from jurisdiction one to landfill one and jurisdiction and tons from jurisdiction two to landfill two. RDRS can currently accommodate that situation just fine, but if the transfer processor doesn't receive those tons from direct haul, if they receive the tons from like another transfer processor, then RDRS can't handle that that reporting scenario and entities have told us that they've asked us how to report and we haven't had a good answer. So we're modifying the regulations to essentially allow that reporting by allowing the transfer processor who needs to send the tons to the landfill to report the inflow as direct haul. Um, so that's a very, that's a very uh, specific change. I won't go into the details there any more than that, just because that won't apply to too many people. But the main change that will apply to more transfer processors is that for tons that a transfer processor accepts other than disposal for purposes other than disposal or beneficial reuse you'll have to report the total tons by collection method and we're not asking you to report material type that's important so you won't have to you know look into the bins that are coming from the contract hauler and say well, 100 tons of recyclables were from mixed recycling and 100 tons were from source separated. No, it's just it's just going to be by collection method, what are the tons for each of this collection method? And it's also not going to be by reporting entity. So if you receive, as a transfer processor, if you receive tons from two separate source transfer processors, like from, you know, you two inflows in your inflows table one, 
you won't need to report the collection methods separately for each of those inflows. It's just all going to be aggregated across all of your inflows. Um, and we're doing that because we thought that would be sort of less burdensome for the stakeholders. It's just eat, and it'd be less to report in RDRS. And we don't really think we need that really granular information about collection method from specific reporting entity, entity sources. Okay. So let's keep going to the next kind of big change here. So the next big change, um, you notice we've made some other additions here. These aren't really major changes for the broker. You notice there's a line here about broker transporters. And um, that's again, because we're now discriminating between broker transporters who send material, who take control of material outside of California versus who take control inside of California. So if you're sending to a broker transporter who takes control outside of California, you're effectively um, sending that material outside of California. So sending it beyond the state's jurisdiction. And in that case, we're now treating that as, you know, effectively that's, that's sort of left. So we're not going to require the reporting entity destination in that scenario. Instead, it's just going to be by region. So if the broker transporter takes control in Nevada, you would report Nevada rather than the specific broker transporter who you're sending to. We've done sort of that, that change in each of our reporting entity sections. So for each of transfer, processor, transfer processors, uh, disposal entities, recycler composters, and so on, whenever you send a to a broker transporter who takes control out of California, you're just going to be reporting material um, by region. So I won't go through those changes for those other sections. It's just the same for each of them. Coming back to transfer processors though, specifically, the one new reporting change, there's some other changes up here in paragraph three, but those aren't um, really substantive. The main change is mixed plastic waste. So again, this is the same as contract haulers. Whenever you send material, send mixed plastic waste material uh, out of country, if you've exported it, you'll have to report the tons um, by jurisdiction of origin. We'll also be asking you to report the tons by the destination region. So if you have an, a mixed plastic waste export, you might be reporting as something like this went to, went to Thailand. It was mixed plastic waste composed entirely of mixed plastic six and seven, and it all came from Davis, California. So you would report that. And this is going to be the same for all of our reporting entities as well. As well. So contract haulers who export, TPs who export, disposal facilities, recycler composters, broker transporters, any reporting entity who exports mixed plastic waste will have to report the same uh, level of detail information in RDRS. And it's basically the same language um, in each section. So I won't go through that. All right, we've made some changes to paragraphs D and E. Uh, these really refer to uh, the 1383 regulations. And we're not really changing anything here. We're just clarifying that what material should really be reported, which people have been reporting correctly. Uh, but there are some just oversights in the writing of the language so that it wasn't clear what should actually be reported. Uh, for example, Paragraph 2B says that uh, material that is recovered from the source separated should be reported, but section 17409.5.1, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is really talking about material that's removed and sent to disposal. So that's what we're clarifying here. And people have been reporting the disposal because that's what 17409D2 says, but we just wanted to clarify that. So that's not really a, a change to. It's not an increase to reporting in RDRS, just a clarification. And E is referring to how the department calculates a recovery efficiency. So that doesn't affect the transfer processor reporting entity reporting in any way. It's just how the department will calculate the uh, recovery efficiency rate. 
without going too much into the details of it, the original regulations basically said we would average the recovery efficiency from each quarter. Uh, but if the recovery efficiencies from each quarter are based on different total tons, like if Q1 has 1,000 tons and Q2 has 100 and Q3 has 300, that wouldn't appropriately really reflect, reflect the recovery efficiency. So instead, we're going to be doing it based on the total tons received across the quarters, not looking at averaging the raw percentages. And that's the same for F, just source separated rather than mixed solid waste or uh, mixed organic waste, excuse me. The, the last main change for transfer processors uh, in H is that we are requiring transfer processors now to provide information to reporting entities rather than to the department. And this is mainly, this is partially for the goal of what I mentioned earlier about allowing transfer processors who send material to specific destinations to report those origins. And in order for this to happen, the sending transfer processor would need to send along the origins to the transfer processor who is actually sending them to disposal. So that's what we are um, adding here in the regulations in paragraph one. If uh, the destination facility requests the origins, then the transfer processor, you should provide them to the destination. So it's only going to be if requested here for this paragraph one. Um, and likewise, paragraph two is a similar idea, but it's basic, it's for material sent to a recycler, composter, or transfer processor. Um, you need to provide the jurisdiction of origin if requested. And the reason we're doing this is because some facilities have told CalRecycle that they receive uh, materials for processing from jurisdictions that are reasonably far away from their, their facility, and they generate residuals from that processing. Now, the way that RDRS regulations currently work is that those regulations have to be um, host assigned to the facility that did the processing. But the facility has told us, well, that's not really accurate because, you know, we exist in Davis, for example, but we're getting tons from, um, you know, Humboldt. That's not really a real example, but it's just somewhere Humboldt is far away from Davis. So what we're doing is we are allowing the destination facility in Davis to request the origins information from the recycler in Humboldt so that Davis can appropriately assign the origins for the residuals that it generates. So they're just, it won't have to rely on host assignment if it doesn't want to. Uh, but what paragraph three is saying is despite really paragraph one and two for mixed plastic waste that you send, you need to, you have to provide the jurisdiction of origin because facilities have to have that information um, because mixed plastic waste, as required by AB 81, requires jurisdiction of origin. So it's not only if requested by the destination facility for mixed plastic waste, you need, you are required to send those tons. And each of the reporting entities uh, after transfer processors, disposal facilities, broker transporters, recycler composters, they all essentially have the same uh, language with some differences that I'll point out when we get to those sections. Is a question okay. from Carlos Chavez. Right. If we're sending material to a facility in California, why would we have to report recycling origins if we are not exporting it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the reason is that if you send, say, mixed plastic or any or any recycling really that could contain mixed plastic to another facility in California, unless that facility is an end user, you don't know what's going to happen to that material. So if you send mixed recycling to an end user, well, that's done. That They're not a reporting entity in RERS. But if, you, if you're a recycler or a transfer processor and you're sending plastic materials or other recyclables to another transfer processor, well, you don't know what's going to happen to those materials at the second facility. The second facility might pull out the mixed plastic and export them. 
And in order for that facility to be able to report in RDRS, they have to have the origins for that material. So that's why you need to pass along that information so that whatever facility ultimately does the exporting has the information that it needs to report appropriately. Well, reporting origins may only apply to exports, but in order for someone who exports the material to be able to report the origins, they need to get that from the person who they got the material from. So if a recycler directly exported material that it received from just people walking up, then the recycler wouldn't have any, they, they could do that. Um, but if the recycler is receiving material from a transfer processor and the recycler exports mixed plastic waste because it doesn't have anything else to do with it, then the recycler has to report the origins in RDRS and the recycler needs to have those origins. In order for the recycler to have those origins, it either has to host assign them or collect them from the reporting entity that sent them. And the host assignment isn't necessarily going to be an accurate option. So that's why we are requiring reporting entities to pass along this information. Um, but you'll see as we get on in the methods, we're not going to necessarily be requiring everyone who needs to report jurisdiction of origin to do things like gate surveys. You know, the methods aren't going to be, we're trying to leave options in the methods so that the jurisdiction of origin is not overly burdensome for the reporting community. So I'll, I'll get to that once we get to the, the methods. So now we're into the uh, disposal facilities section. The first kind of change here that's not really non-substantive is that uh, we're kind of clarifying how disposal facilities are supposed to report if they receive and directly transfer material. Um, so when disposal facilities receive and directly transfer without doing any kind of uh, without doing any miscellaneous processing, um, whether they how whether they report kind of depends on the material that they're handling. So if a solid waste facility receives and directly transfers solid waste, designated waste, disaster debris, or green or non-green material for, for potential beneficial reuse, which is uh, written out here in paragraph three, then they should really be reporting as a transfer processor because they're they're acting as one. If they just receive material and then send material, they're just acting as a transfer station. So they need to report under the requirements of a transfer processor. But if they're receiving and transferring other material that's you know not solid waste, for example, then they then they can consider that material as having been generated by the disposal facility. And then the regulations in one uh, paragraph one and two apply. And there aren't really any aren't any really new changes in paragraphs one and two. So question, uh, do you have an example of what's not solid waste? So example, example of that would be uh, recycling. So if you receive recycling and you uh, directly transfer that material, you should consider that material as having been uh, generated on site by the disposal facility. So let's continue going. So disposal facilities, as I mentioned, they have to report mixed plastic waste that they export. Um, that's the same as the other, the same requirement as we went over for transfer processors and contract haulers. Eric, I'm seeing a question from Larry Sweetser. Um, so we might unmute Larry and, and see if he can expand upon it. Sure, thanks, Dan. Larry, is there anything you wanted to expand upon for your question? Well, you answered it about the plastics, okay. um, but 
facilities receive material from many jurisdictions, so I'm not sure why the landfill or the disposal facility would have to be the jurisdiction of as a generator, as generated there, if they know what other jurisdictions it's coming from. Well, when we when we talk about material generated, we're not saying that that material should be host assigned to the landfill. It's really about the reporting requirements and B, you're talking about material that's generated by the facility or material that's not generated by the facility. So if, if you receive, um, say, recycling, so if recycling are created, generated, separated, or recovered as a result of on-site activities, then they would be considered generated by the disposal facility and you would be reporting pursuant to um, 1815.9 for those tons. So it's not necessarily requiring that you host a sign. So it's only the material they generate themselves, not the material they receive and then pass on. Right, Oops. but um, yeah. I don't want to say something incorrect, so I think I'll, I'll pause on that and think about it. If you have further questions, we can um, yeah, answer that. I think we'll need to talk about that more. But there's also a timing issue because it's it's common that material go from one transfer station to another, possibly even to another facility after that. And the timing on when the reports are due and when you get the data, there may be a lag or may cause the second facility to be late because they didn't get the data in time. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, it happens. How do we yeah. handle that if we don't get the data? Uh, well, if it happens, you know, the the reporting requirements say that transfer processors have their um, their due dates. So I imagine there will be some training time where each of you learn how to provide material in a timely manner. And of course, I can't recommend that you do this, but there's also the option that um you know if you find later that you had extra information you can revise your reports um, to add that extra information you know it'd be you should try to get it in by the reporting deadline but we do allow you the system does allow you to revise your reports if needed but if i if i'm the second facility and i don't get the data until after i reported or at the same time i've already reported maybe early then i have to revise my report because the first facility was late is that what has to happen? Yeah, if you if if you provided information into RDRS, which you discovered was inaccurate based on updates from the first transfer processor, you should definitely go back into your report and revise it to reflect the new information. Oh, this will be fun. Okay, so I think um, let's continue on to the rest of the disposal facilities. So disposal facilities, they also like transfer processors need to provide collection method. Uh, that's no different. They just provide the collection method as we've described already. Disposal facilities will also need to pass along information for ton sent ex in exactly the same way as transfer processors. So I won't go into kind of the details of the information that they need to pass along there. So now we're in the uh, recycler composter section. So recycler composters, again, we have the changes relevant to when you send tons to a broker transporter, that's the same as I've already described. You know, if broker transporter takes control outside of California, then you just need to provide the material type by region. I don't go into that in any more uh, detail. So recycler composters, they also need to provide collection method. You notice that the language here is a little bit different from what we wrote before. For transfer processors, for example, they provide collection method for tons received for purposes other than uh, disposal, for example. But recycler composters, they just provide collection method for tons received for recycling or composting. 
And that's because recyclers and composters should not be receiving tons for disposal. They should only be receiving tons by definition for recycling or composting. Recycler composters who export mixed plastic also need to report the jurisdiction of origin, region, and material type for that mixed plastic, uh, which is just the same as all of the other uh, reporting entities that we've discussed so far. So the last change for recycler composters is that uh, like TPs and disposal facilities, they need to provide information to destination facilities for tons sent. Uh, but due to uh, 41821.5 week of the public resources code, we cannot require recycler composters to provide jurisdiction of origin. And I see your question, Carlos, I'll answer that in just a, just a moment. Um, or I'll come to that in just a moment. I don't know that I have an answer for you. So because we cannot require recycler composters to provide jurisdiction of origin for non-mixed plastic waste tons, uh, what we're doing is saying that recycler composters may elect, uh, so it's optional, to identify and provide the jurisdiction of origin to the destination. If the sending facility, you know, if the recycler composter does elect to do so, then they need to follow the methods that are um, written out in 1815.9. And this only this election only applies to solid waste and uh, material sent for recycle solid waste green material and material sent for recycling um, to the facilities listed in B. But uh, all of that notwithstanding, so if a recycler composter sends mixed plastic specifically to a reporting entity, then you do need then you are required to provide the jurisdiction of origin for those tons. And the reason it's required for mixed plastic is because 41821.5 specifically gives Tower Cycle the authority to require origins for mixed plastic. It doesn't give us the authority for other non-mixed plastic waste tons, which is why it's optional for everything other than mixed plastic. But for mixed plastic, it is, um, it's required. And there's a question in the chat, you know, what percentage of California's mixed plastics are exported? Um, well, we don't really have a way to estimate that because of course, not all of California's mixed plastics are going to be um, exported. And we could, I could try to estimate that, but you'd have to, send us an email because I, I can't do that just off the top of my head right now. I don't I don't have that information. I don't want to make something up and give you, you know, just totally a wrong number. But if you are curious, um, send our rulemaking email um, a message and, and we can try to delve into that for you. For those curious, I, I also forgot that I was going to add our rulemaking uh, email to the chat, which I'll do just now for reference, if you want to send an email now or at some point uh, later on. So continuing back to, coming back to the regulations here, we go on to brokers and transporters. Uh, again, brokers and transporters, it's really just the same changes as recyclers and composters. Um, they need to, report a collection method, except brokers and transporters, they don't really accept tons for processing. So brokers and transporters are going to be required to report collection method for tons sent rather than tons accepted because they don't really have tons accepted. They just kind of take the material and send it out. And then they'll be required to provide region, material type and jurisdiction for exported mixed plastic waste. And I haven't mentioned this thus far, but I should have these these requirements for collection method and exported mixed plastic. The reporting for them does not start until 2024 Q4. That's one of the changes that we specified will not start until Q4. And you'll notice that we haven't written that here 
in each of the reporting entity sections because that's covered in the methods. The methods section lists uh, when those are required. Brokers and transporters, like recycler composters, they have to provide information to a destination reporting entity. And again, it's not required for any material other than mixed plastic waste, essentially, but for mixed plastic, it is required to provide the origins. So uh, let's talk about methods. And I'm not actually going to do this in order because we've been talking about a collection method and origins. Uh, first, I'm going to do B, which deals with, um, which includes our new changes for origins, essentially. One of the, the things in B that kind of comes throughout the methods actually is that um, our method sections currently, they often say, they often use the words or using other methods. So you are able to provide information to the department using methods as specified in the regulations or using other methods. And where we have done that, we've now added language to say, these other methods have to be approved by the department per 18815.9M. And to scroll quickly to 18815.9M, it's really just the simple thing that uh, the reporting entity, and this doesn't start until reporting period one of 2024, you just submit a request to the department. Um, I can't say whether we'll build this into RDRS or whether it will just be you send us an email. Um, but it, you know, if we don't build it into RDRS immediately, then of course you'll just send us an email um, or you know snail mail, whatever your preference is, I suppose. And then we'll have 60 days to review and approve the method. And you'd basically just need to justify why this is a reasonable method. And Larry, I see your question on page 32. Let's come to that when we start reviewing that, that section. So coming back to the origins, um, we have added a variety of new paragraph or several new paragraphs to the origins uh, methods. And most of these changes are really geared towards allowing facilities to report more granular information for material that they would have previously host assigned. So I mentioned an example earlier where a transfer processor uh, in Davis, for example, might receive material like residual solid waste disposal from a recycler composter in Humboldt. Currently, the way that would play out in RDRS is that the Davis transfer processor would host assign those materials to the location from which the or from their own location or they would host assign them to the recycler comp where the recycler composter came from so either humboldt or to davis and now what we're saying is we're basically allowing the transfer processor to attempt to do other methods so if the transfer processor gets the origins information for those materials from the facility in Humboldt, then the transfer processor can report those. It doesn't, it doesn't have to host assign them anymore just because they are residuals. Conversely, if the facility cannot reasonably track jurisdiction for the generated materials, but you accept origins for the accepted materials just as a whole. Like if you don't know what your residuals are specifically, but you do know that your inflows are 50% jurisdiction one and 50% jurisdiction two, then you would just say that your residuals are 50% J1 and 50% J2. But we're also including this last option, which is basically our typical host assignment scenario, where if you are generating facility, generating residuals on site. So it's not really the Davis facility receiving tons from Humble. It's like the Davis facility is generating its own uh, residuals. Then you would just um, post assign them to yourself if you can't figure it out. And, and it looks like uh, Larry is saying in the comment that allocating 
residuals has been standard practice. Um, that's great. It's great that you guys have been been doing that, but the regulations didn't really specifically clarify that 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 was allowed. So we're now we're trying to include those scenarios into the regulations so that like on the ground practice is really reflected in the regulations themselves. Uh, recyclers, composters, brokers, and transporters previously were required to just host assigned tons to themselves. Uh, and now paragraph 2.5 is saying that they're allowed to use other methods effectively. Uh, we have some options here where they can request information from the person bringing the materials. They could use periodic reports, like if they're receiving material from a contract hauler, or they could use other methods approved by the department. And finally, if they can't do any of that, if all of that is not really possible for their facility, meaning, you know, I know that there are recyclers who just let people come up and drop off material and there's no gate attendant, then you could really just host a sign um, as per normal, or not necessarily normal, but you could host a sign to your own facility. Uh, so that's what 2.5 is about, is really um, residual or jurisdiction for materials received by recyclers, composters, and broker transporters. 2.4 is jurisdiction for um, materials that are accepted and generated. 2.6 is about uh, what you do if you are supposed to receive origins. Um, but the facility does not give you those origins, then it just A, B, C, and D specify what you're supposed to do. Um, for example, if if the recipient reporting entity is a broker transporter, like if you are a broker transporter and you're reporting, then you would just report the jurisdiction of origin as where you took control of the material. Alternatively, if you are not a broker transporter, and if the sending facility is a transfer processor, for example, then you would determine the jurisdiction of origin um, where the sending facility is, is located. And likewise, see, I won't go through C and D, but basically this is just saying how you are supposed to derive jurisdiction of origin if you were supposed to have received it from the sending facility and they didn't give it to you. Uh, 3.5 is about how transfer processors are supposed to determine the jurisdiction of origin for material sent. So when a transfer processor is giving the jurisdiction of origin to the destination, they need to figure that out based on allocations from in inbound materials. So if you've got 50-50% from two jurisdictions on your inbound, then based on who you're sending a facility to, you would report, you know, 50-50 or maybe it's 75-25 if you are sending jurisdictions to different facilities based on the based on the destination facility. And that's basically the same as what transfer processors are already doing when they report in RDRS. It's just that they're not reporting that in RDRS anymore. Or they're not reporting for this material in RDRS. They're giving it to the destination. Uh, paragraph four, you've no, you'll notice that we basically struck out the entire original paragraph and added um, a new new language here. So paragraph four was originally the paragraph that specified that recyclers, composters, and others needed to host assign material. And now what we're saying is that recyclers, composters, and others four tons sent, they figure out jurisdiction of origin based on A, B, and C. And it's the same logic as what we determined earlier, where if you absolutely cannot determine what the origins are, then you'll follow C, so you'll host a sign. If you, for whatever reason, can specifically track the origins, like you know what the origins are on both your inflow and your outflow side, then you can report those origins specifically. But if you don't know the origins of your outflow and you do know the origins of your inflow, then you would report the origins proportionally. Like if your inflow is 60-40, then your outflows would be 60-40 as well. And paragraph five, it kind of our last origins change, last but not least, 
is that commencing a reporting period for 2024, you are going to determine the jurisdiction of origin for exported mixed waste based on allocations of inbound materials. So as the exporting entity, the person who sent you the material should give you the origins and you should know like, okay, I got 60% of my inflow from entity X and it was all from jurisdiction one and I got 40% of my inflow from entity Y and it was all from jurisdiction two. So my outflow will be 60% jurisdiction one and 40% jurisdiction two. Basically you just need to figure that out and then report the origins in RDRS. So that's kind of the origin section. Let's jump back to the material type since I think Carlos or maybe, sorry, someone else was asking about the uh, material types earlier. Uh, to section A, subdivision A, we've made a variety of changes that are mostly just organizational. Some are just organizational and clarifying. Um, for example, point four and point five, uh, these sections pre mostly previously existed in the regulations, but we're just reorganizing it so it's clearer. So if you send material to a disposal facility for disposal, then that's solid waste. Like it doesn't matter if it's actually plastic bottles, number one, um, you don't get to call it recycling. If it's sent to a disposal facility for disposal, then it's solid waste and you need to report it as solid waste, in which case jurisdiction of origin reporting requirements um, would apply. The, the other main changes in kind of the material type section, which is subdivision A, are that we have clarified how entities basically report material type. So material type reporting varies based on reporting entity and material stream. So whether you need to provide a specific material type depends on whether you're reporting, say, solid waste, which is the material stream, or whether you are like a recycler composter. So for example, um, recycler composters who report solid waste, they need to report the material type. And that's what uh, subdivision B or paragraph subparagraph B here says recyclers and composters need to report the material type, including residuals, including four residuals uh, versus contract haulers and and transfer processors. For example, they only they don't provide material type for those materials. They all materials in the solid waste, designated waste, and disaster debris streams are just are just those streams. There's no material type. And everything else, other materials reported according to paragraph two, and beneficial reuses reported according to paragraph three. There are no changes in paragraph three. Um, the main change in paragraph two is that we've added some examples to clarify that material type includes form, say bottles, cans, and that starting in 2024 Q4, if you report a um, a non-homogeneous flow of material. So if you say report mixed plastic waste, in RDRS you'll need to tell us what are the individual components of that mix of that outflow. You won't need to do it by tons, but if your outflow is a mixture of mixed plastic and it includes HDPE bottles, PET bottles, and non-bottle rigids, for example, you'll have to report those in RDRS. And you might be wondering why we're doing that. Uh, we're doing that for several reasons, one of which is that um, SB 343 requires us to collect material type and form information for materials that are uh, sent to recovery and uh, recycling. So that's why we need kind of this more granular information. If people, if everybody reports mixed plastic, you know, we don't have enough information to meet our requirements for SB 343. Similarly, SB 1335 requires more detailed information about um, the specific materials that are recycled. And so we're hoping that this uh, reporting in RDRS can also assist with SB 1335. So that's material type. Um, I see your question, Larry. So let's 
let's jump to the next section, which is subdivision uh, C. Uh, what what is your comment on small vehicles? That's the first thing here. So why don't we just jump to that? So I think I understand what you're trying to do by separating out small vehicles into self hauled commercial, residential. Um, but the requirement that they have a commercial emblem or like commercial license plate is not universal. There are many commercial entities that don't have those and are, and are recognized as commercial and they're self haul in smaller vehicles. Yes, uh, we, we realize that and um, it's not, it's not going to be a perfect solution and you know not all small vehicles are going to be um residential self-haul they might be commercial self-haul even if they don't have an emblem on them but short of having short of requiring a reporting entity to ask every single vehicle coming in where are you residential or self or commercial there's not really a great um way to do that so what we're trying to do in the regulations is balance getting more detailed information versus creating undue reporting burden for the reporting entities so we don't necessarily want to require you to ask every single person who comes in um, because that's not really feasible for a lot of facilities on the other hand we do want to get at least some information and generally small vehicles are probably not going to be commercial so it it, it you know we do what we can right and if you have other suggestions about what what the best way to piece those out in a not in a way that's not overly burdensome, um, please send them to the inbox, and we can try to work through those. Well, let me further follow up because representing rural counties, we like simple. So simple is hard to do. I understand that, and I appreciate that. But we may also be able to prefer to do that just because we may need to track those commercial entities for mandatory commercial recycling AB 341 purposes. So this would take away that tool to use because, so I think this one needs a bit more thought. I appreciate having a default simple option, but there should be an allowance for some other method for doing that than just arbitrarily based on a license plate or an emblem. Yeah, so one one important thing to keep in mind is that paragraph one is just one of the methods. Um, you can use any of the methods in, in subdivision C. And for example, paragraph um, four says that you can ask the driver of each incoming load. So we still do have that option if you wanna ask each individual driver. You're not required to classify a small vehicle as um, residential cell hall, for example. Yeah, it's not clear that that was an option. I'll look at it again. But... Okay. I'll, let me mute you and then I'll answer the other question. Yeah. So we have a, another question. Uh, so if you have a mixed recycling container that the public puts, puts mixed recycling into at a landfill, uh, do I need to climb into the roll off to figure it out. Um, so Valerie, can you clarify what you mean? Are, are, you, are you talking about figuring out the jurisdiction of origin or figuring out the material type or what? And if you prefer to speak your comment, I can uh, unmute you. Um, okay, for material type. So if you have a mixed recycling that the pu public puts mixed recycling into a landfill. Um, so if you really have no idea what the material types are that are going into your outflow, and again, for, for recycling, RDRS does not require reporting of inflows. You know, this is really just reporting of outflows. So the reason we're framing the regulations in the material type in this way, let me jump back to that section. The reason we're requiring 
people to provide the specific materials in a general mixture is that uh, we are operating under the assumption that when you sell or transfer a material to a destination facility, that destination facility is not really often going to just want mixed materials. They, want, they might want to know what's in it generally. And so if you have to tell that to the destination, then you can tell it to RDRS. On the other hand, if you really are sending material to a facility and that and you have no idea what that recycling is other than it's recycling, um, then I think we'd have to chat about that on, amongst you know on our end, but I think what we would have you do is just just report it as mixed recycling still because you really have no idea what it is. We would not want you to have to go through and uh, potentially do the dangerous thing of you know sorting, jumping into a roll off and and literally sorting what's in there, of course. Um, and it might be pretty burdensome for for you to hire people to sort that. So I don't think that's what we would want. Can you chime yeah. in on that, Dan? Yeah, it, it's not our intent to have people sort material be beyond a level that they're sorting for their own operations. The intent of that, you know, determining the component material types of mixed outflows is that if you're sending a bailed outflow, so I mean that involves processing, right? Sorting and bailing of material. It may be a mixed plastic, um, but by your specifications of your operations, you would know what plastics you are sorting out of your line and putting into those bales just by design. That's what we're really looking at is by design with what are going into those bales. Not, um, if, if you're not doing any processing, so in this case, it's a roll off container, it's not being processed at that landfill. Um, you know, it, it's just going, you know, that roll off is being taken somewhere else where the pr pr uh, processing does occur that facility when they send that material out after they've processed it you know they have some sort of specification that's when we would be looking for those component materials um for you we'd make sure that there's uh an option that you know rather than selecting what the material components are you could select that you do not process or sort these materials excellent thanks for that dan Yeah, I see that Larry, you had an additional comment about how roll-offs are sometimes, um, you know, transferred by a commercial operator, but they are actually include or contain residential waste. Uh, that is something that we thought of as well. You know, if if someone's house is being demolished, um, it's sort of residential in that the materials generated by the residential home but the resident is not doing the demolishing. You know, they're paying a commercial company to do the demolishing. So it's not necessarily always clear whether things are gonna be commercial or residential. So yeah, we're really, it's really hard, I think, to have a good balance between simplicity and, and accuracy, but we're totally willing to um, hear more thoughts on that. I think, I think it'd be better if you like send us an email rather than kind of going into the nitty gritty of that uh, right now. Yeah, we definitely appreciate that, Larry. We, we've had these discussions quite a bit. Um, you know, if if there's debris from having your roof done, is that commercial or residential? Um, you know, so these are all very, very good questions and we just have to draw the line somewhere and, and it can legitimately be argued in multiple ways. So we just do the best we can at, at drawing that line where we think it's it's reasonable and, and then that's how we consider source sector. Yeah, and speaking of source sector, one of the things that you'll notice here is that uh, paragraph five talks about assigning disaster debris and designated waste. And these are going to be just always self-hauled. Um, and that's because there's not really a great logical reason to consider disaster debris, for example, residential or commercial. During a disaster cleanup, they're not really gonna be you know, looking at that breakdown um, a lot. So for the purposes of RDRS, these materials are always going to be self-hauled and they're not currently reported in RDRS since RDRS only talks about source sector of solid waste and that's not gonna change. Um, so source sector is really just applied to solid waste 
in RDRS. And I mentioned this uh, earlier for material that you receive, say from a, a recycler, like if you get residual solid waste from a recycler and you're disposing that at your landfill, you know, you would just say that you got that from a recycler. We're not going to be asking you to figure out is that residential or commercial um, solid waste. It's just from a recycler at that point. So let's keep going through the methods. Uh, let's see, find. the One of the big changes here and the rest of the methods is that we have in J, 1815.9J, we talk about the material streams that RDRS has for outflows. And we're adding a new um, section here for mixed or new paragraph, I should say, for mixed plastic waste. So what, what that means is that if you export mixed plastic waste, that's going to be reported separately in a new material stream in RDRS. And we're doing that as opposed to just looking at, say, tons that are exported in the recycling composting versus end use streams and so on. Uh, we're, we're not doing that because we figured that would just be kind of too complicated. It'd be easier just to say, you've got a mixed plastic waste export, that's gonna go in its own stream. So you're gonna report that separately. So there will be adding a new material stream to RDRS. And K here, uh, J is about how you report material stream for outflows. K, which is a new subdivision, analogously talks about material stream, but for inflows. And we receive questions every so every so often about how people should be reporting inflows that they that they process and do things with. So we wanted to clarify what should happen um, in those various cases. And that's what K does. Paragraph one just lists all of the inflow streams and what's required for the inflow. So that's not anything new. That's really covered elsewhere in the regulations, but paragraph one is just a nice summary there. Paragraph two says that if you accept material for recycling or composting, you don't report that as an inflow, and that's not new. Uh, but we are emphasizing that if your recycling is contaminated with solid waste, such that it can't be handled by a recycling center, which is basically the three-part rule. Like if your inbound recycling or composting is, for example, more than 10% contaminated with solid waste, you need to consider that material as solid waste. You know, Just because you accept it as recycling doesn't necessarily mean it qualifies as recycling. Um, that's what paragraph two is about. Paragraph three is, is what I mentioned earlier about how you are supposed to report um, materials that based on processing three and four are really that way. So if you accept materials and you don't process them, um, then you just classify them into the ton sent. Like if you have material, then, and you, if you accept material and you send it out for beneficial reuse, then you should report it as accepted as beneficial reuse. Uh, conversely, if you do some processing, you, you have to kind of think about what's going on. Um, first of all, if you generate solid waste from your processing, then you'll need to report as inflow the residual solid waste that you generated. Um, and the reason that is, is because we require origins for solid waste and green material for beneficial reuse, for example. And if you don't report that inflow, then there's no origins for those tons. So that's why we need to have uh, those inflows reported out separately. Um, on the other hand, if your processing generates solid waste, um, but that solid waste is say more, more than 10% of the accepted material, then all of the accepted material, as we said earlier, really needs to be uh, reported as, as solid waste. Um, Oh, excuse me, I, I said something wrong there earlier. I was saying, um, if residual solid waste is generated, 
uh, from tons accepted as solid waste. Like, so if you accept solid waste and you do some processing on that solid waste to recover things, then um, the residual tons should be reported as part of the original accepted uh, tonnage. But if you accept material not for solid waste, like if you're not, if it's accepted for recycling and it's say 5% solid waste, then you would pull out the 5% that was solid waste and report that separately as an inflow. That's what's covered in D. And for materials that you kind of generate or process into multiple streams, we're sort of asking you to do that by uh, kind of how it's, how it's processed. So if, if a reporting entity accepts a mixed material stream, I'm looking at paragraph C now, and if it's ultimately sent out as 75% one stream and 25% another stream, then you would classify it on the inbound side as that majority stream, as the 75% stream. In this example, it's non-green, but you know that applies to anything. And if it were 75% recycling, then that would mean you know you wouldn't report that recycling inbound because you know you don't report recycling in RDRS. So we only have about 20 minutes left. So let's, I'm going to continue on. I realize that's kind of confusing, but we'll continue on to collection uh, method. So that's what subdivision L is. Subdivision L specifies how people are supposed to acquire and then provide collection method. Um, contract haulers, basically they just report it to the department. Contract haulers also need to provide the collection method to the reporting entity if they are giving to a reporting entity in state. Contract haulers can use any of the, spe any of the listed methods, very similar to jurisdiction of origin, contract agreements, billing records, and so on. A reporting entity um, other than a hauler base, needs to report collection method as specified in paragraph four, which is basically just, if you get it from a contract hauler, then you re report what the contract hauler tells you. If you don't get it from a contract hauler, then it's either going to be self-hauled residential or self-hauled commercial because presumably it's, it's coming from um, a generator, if it's coming from a generator. And then you're just going to determine, you know, is it, is it recycling? Was it mixed recycling bins on your site? And so on. If you are generating materials through an on-site recycler composter, like if you're a transfer processor and it's the on-site recycler that's generating the materials, then you just need to follow the rules as specified in A, B, and C for the recycler composter. Um, and if you are generating through other on-site activities, then, then you would report as that on-site activity. Uh, so if you had other on-site activities besides a recycler or composter, then you would report as that, uh, as your reporting entity. So if you had, if you're a landfill and you had miscellaneous recycling going on, you don't really have an official recycler, then you might report the collection type as the landfill, say as the generating facility. And M we already talked about, just if you have alternative methods that you want us to consider, send us a message. Uh, we'll have 60 days to review and we'll get back to you. Uh, 1815.10, no changes. So I'm just going to skip skip right through that. Uh, 1815.11, the only change here is that uh, we are requiring additional re record retentions. So 1815.11 is about record retention, and B1 is specifically about record keeping records for origins. Originally, B1 specified that you need to keep the kind of origins records for solid waste, but obviously you report origins for more than just solid waste or also green material and um, exported origins. So paragraph one is expanded now to refer to any material for which jurisdiction of origin is required. Um, so that would be solid waste, green material and mixed plastic waste really effectively. 12, no changes made to that section. So again, just skipping through that. Uh, point 13, no changes made. 
And the last section of the regulatory changes um, is not actually in our RDRS regulations, but it's in a different article, Article 9, rather than 9.25. And it's in a different section, 18794.2. Uh, the reason we are updating this section, because this is talking about reporting requirements for calculations in the year, the electronic annual report. So how, how tons and how disposal, what numbers kind of go into the disposal calculation. Uh, the main change here that's substantive is that we've added a paragraph seven to specify that mixed plastic waste that's considered disposal, according to 41781.4, will be considered disposal for the purposes of this uh, section. And the reason we have to do that, of course, is because uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six specify all the different ways that all the different things that go into disposal and AB881 added a new disposal type, export and mixed plastic. So we had to add that into uh, C. But this doesn't affect anything in RDRS. Uh, this is uh, really just the disposal calculation which RDRS numbers are used for. And that's the last change. I realized that was a very um, fast overview of all of our changes. I apologize that uh, you know we couldn't go into detail on everything, but we have about 15 more minutes. So if there are specific questions, uh, we're happy to uh, go through uh, those in more detail now. If there are no questions, uh, you're free to, you know, we'll just, uh, Priya, myself, and Dan will hang out on the line until 12. So, you know, you can feel free to think about it for the next uh, several minutes and just let us know when you have a question. Uh, when are we accepting, we have a comp, we have a question, when are we accepting comments? So this is just an informal uh, workshop. We're not, this is not a formal hearing where we have 45 days. Um, so there's no sort of comment period. If, if you want us to really, to think about your comments, probably the sooner the better. Um, we're trying to get the formal rulemaking started around November. Um, but we have, you know, go through several internal stages before the regulations get approved. So we really need to um, kind of get the final draft sorted probably in the next several weeks. So if you want to get us uh, comments before then, that would that would be ideal. Who is the best contact for comments? You know, just send them any comments to the rulemaking email, which is in the chat. Um, you don't need to address it to anyone. You know. It, we're just a rulemaking team. If you want to send it to somebody, you can say, dear Eric, that's fine. But it's just the, the rulemaking team.
Okay, we have another question in the chat. So um, if a jurisdiction collected mixed plastic but sorts it into the component types, as long as the jurisdictions has a market for each type of plastic, will the jurisdiction be able to consider the material recyclable and count towards their diversion rate? Uh, so that's a great question. That depends on what the facility who it is doing with it. So if the facility sorts the mixed plastic into each individual resin, like if they sort one, two, three, five, and seven into separate bales, one, two, three, five, and seven, then it's not mixed plastic because mixed plastic, well, um, five and seven would be considered mixed plastic still. Uh, not, not five, excuse me. Three and seven would be considered mixed plastic by our definition, even if they're not separated. That's an important distinction. Um, so the, the statute, the way it's worded, uh, is worded to imply that mixtures of plastics three, four, six, and seven um, are mixed plastic, even if they're not mixture, like plastic number three is considered mixed plastic, even if it's not mixed with anything else. And that's the way our regulations are currently written. Um, you're welcome to make a comment on that. You can check that out in 18815.2. Uh, 10.5 is collection method. The definition for mixed plastic is 38.4. Um, you can look at that and think about that and send this comment if you want. So if it's like only number three, that would still be considered mixed, uh, mixed plastic and therefore would be considered disposal for the purposes of AB881. But if you pulled out one, two, and five, even if one, two, and five were mixed together, as long as it was only one, two, and five, that would not be considered uh, disposal. Does that answer your question? Okay. Sure. Yeah. The next question is, uh, do you anticipate further training uh, for upcoming changes? So uh, what we will do is we'll, of course, once we start the formal rulemaking, we'll have uh, a formal hearing to uh, accept comments after the 45 days. We're not currently planning on having any more informal workshops, uh, but that may change if people are you know, request that or we decide internally that we really need to do that. Um, in addition to the, you know, the rulemaking, we're also, of course, going to have trainings on the changes to RDRS. You know, the regulations are going to require changes to RDRS, and so we'll have trainings on that. You know, we're not just going to implement the changes and say, have fun. Uh, we'll have workshops and train videos to say, these are what the changes are. Uh, this is what um, this is how you fill out the new the new requirements. I also mentioned we'll likely have workshops on developing the new kind of collection method options as well as changes to the material type list. So or was that you, Dan, gonna chime in? Uh, yeah, no, I was um, I was going to mention the the you know training materials that we developed for RDRS, but you captured that. Um, and then I just saw a question come in um, from Ed Boyson about the um, um, disposal. And and no, no, remember that uh, it would only be considered disposal if it's exported to another country. Um, and and in actuality, those other countries also at this time do not include Mexico or Canada, and that's defined by the statute. So we're only talking about when these um, you know these plastics are exported overseas, uh, and in such a way that we do not have any verification that that material um, is recycled as opposed to disposed or incinerated and things like that. And so um, that's straight from AB 881, um, and so we're not, you know, we don't have any latitude to change how that may play out. Um, but that's that's what it is. It's specifically for overseas export. Thanks for that clarification, Dan. That's great. Okay, there's another question from Jim J. Uh, would it be possible to address specifically include? Uh, the 
uh, wastewater treatment plant, biosolids sent to a composting facility. So biosolids that are sent to a composting facility, you know, that's going to be an outflow of recycling composting. I'm not sure what your question is regarding that. I mean, if you're talking about our new changes for AB 881 and SB 343, AB 881 doesn't apply because that's mixed plastic waste and biosolids are not uh, mixed plastic waste. If you're talking about um, collection method, a wastewater treatment plant is going to be considered a recycler composter in the regulations. So they are going to be required to provide collection method for inbound materials, not for um, outbound. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that we're gonna see that many changes to um, wastewater treatment facility reporting. Um, so in this case, they're currently required to report on biosolids sent to a composting facility as a recycler composter outflow. Um, that would remain the same. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure they may have to do a collection method, but in this case, you know, we will have collection method options that are applicable to wastewater treatment plants. Um, so in that case, um, you know, I, I think it would be a relatively minor addition to current reporting requirements. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Larry, I see your question. I'm going to jump to the next one just to briefly cover that, and then I'll come back to yours. Uh, the next question is, how and when will the recyclable material type list be uh, published or discussed? Well, the RDRS um, material types list is, is already published. So if you go to your favorite uh, search engine and type in RDRS material types list, you can see the recycling and disposal reporting material type list is just a document. You click on that, it'll download. And these are all of the material type options that we have in RDRS. So you can see that already. In terms of when are we talking about the changes to them, uh, this may change, but my current understanding of our plan is that we're going to work on updating this once we get the regulations finalized, because you know the regulations will, will change as we go through the uh, rulemaking process. So it doesn't necessarily make sense for us to really start editing this now. Uh, once we have a finalized version of the regulations, or at least at a point where we think we're not going to make major changes, uh, then, then we can start thinking about how we're going to edit this material type list to better capture uh, what, what SP343 requires. And I can post this link in the chat as well. Coming back to Larry's question, let me go to the rulemaking page again. Um, page seven, number 43, indicates that recycling, okay. So here we are on the definitions. Uh, so Larry is asking about 43 in that our definition of recycling now includes this new option or this new text saying that a recycler composter is the has the same meaning as defined in 418 except that recycling shall also include all activities considered recycling based on 4182.5. So the reason we added this change is that SB 54 recently edited 4182.5 and will take effect January 1st, 2023 to specify that um, facilities that handle recyclable material are considered recyclers, even if that material was not previously discarded. Um, and so all of this, all 43 is doing is saying that our definition of recycler also includes the facilities that SB 54 modified 41821.5 uh, to include. And if there's anything else we should say on that, I'll defer to Dan. Yeah, this is um, really uh, simply a, a change that allows um, the regulations to be in agreement 
um, or adapt to any statutory changes that may occur. So it, it's really letting the statute speak for itself. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, the last few questions here before we have to check out would be, uh, just to clarify, is all mixed plastic waste counted as solid waste or just mixed plastics uh, three, four, and seven? So it's really just plastics um, three, four, and seven, or it could be plastics one and two if those plastics are mixed with three, four, or seven. Secondly, it's not really counted as solid waste. Um, it's counted as disposal. When you report in RDRS, we're not going to ask you to report mixed plastic waste in the solid waste stream. It's going to be its own, its own new stream. Um, it's really just that these mixed plastics will be considered disposal um, for the purposes of the electronic annual report or the year. And only when they're exported. Um, right, and only when they're exported. Again, thank you for that. And we have a last question. Can you give an example of how a wastewater, tramp is, a wastewater treatment plant facility would report um, origins. So that's, I mean, that's the same as it is currently. If a wastewater treatment plant facility uh, sends um, an outflow of like residual solid waste to a disposal facility, they're not going to report that in RDRS. Um, they don't report that now, and we're not going to ask them to report it. But what we would be asking them to do and not requiring, because this is, they're considered a recycler, not a, not a disposal facility or a transfer processor is they would give the jurisdiction to the landfill and that jurisdiction is defined in our regulations where a jurisdiction is either um, a city or like an unincorporated county or a regional agency. And I'm getting an error on my end now that screen sharing is paused. It doesn't seem that I can undo that, but we're over time by a few minutes. So I think we'll stop for today. And if you have any questions, please uh, send them to the rulemaking inbox, which again, I've posted in the chat, uh, but I'll just read it out, uh, which is SB 343 underscore AB 881 underscore rulemaking at cowrecycle.ca.gov. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really great to have uh, such an interactive audience and, and helping us to uh, make the regulations as good as we can and to not and to have sort of interactive feedback with, with the stakeholders. So that's really great. And thank you all for participating. And we'll, we'll let you know any, any other updates as they come out. And thank you once again and have a great day, everyone.